Coming to you live from Radio Canaan Studio. For the record. For the record. For the record. Here, Here from, from your, your government, government officials, officials, independents, and the opposition on issues that matter to you. For the record. Engage in an open dialogue between residents and lawmakers. For the record. For the record. For the record. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1-800-534-8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record. And now, your host, Arit Connor. Good morning and welcome to For the Record. This rainy Monday morning, the 21st of August, 2000. And 17. I trust that everyone had an enjoyable, uh, peaceful uh, weekend. Um, I want to thank you, our listening and viewing audience, for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy and wet roads of the Cayman Islands into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. And if you, of course, if you're working in the outdoors today, it's going to be quite challenging uh, if the rain continues uh, to come down as well. Of course, For the Record is a show produced by the staff and the management of Radio Cayman, and it is geared towards keeping you abreast of issues as they arise and play out on the local, regional, and international scene. I am your host, Dorit Connor, my co-host, Dr. Steve Macfield, and we also have with us in the studio this morning co-hosting uh, Mr. Gilbert uh, McLean. You can join us in the conversation by calling us on our toll-free number, provided courtesy of Flow, that toll-free number, 1-800-534-8255. You can also call us on 949-8037 and 949-6990. And if you don't like to talk on the telephone, then email us at for the record. That is one word, for the record, at C-A-N-D-W dot K-Y. If you do decide to call, then after being missing in action for a few weeks, you will Again, hear that beautiful radio voice of Miss Susan Watson taking your calls when you do call in, and we want to welcome Miss Susan back. We also have some sad news, and uh, uh, we want to extend our sincere condolences to one of our Radio Cayman family members here, uh, uh, Mr. Lox LeBanks, in the uh, passing of his wife, Miss Julian Banks. We also want to extend our condolences and our uh, sympathies to uh, the family members, the Da Costa uh, family, you know, as well. Um, and to say that we all feel your loss, uh, your loss is our loss uh, as well. We have again lost um, a daughter uh, of the soil who had an impact during her lifetime uh, in the Cayman Islands as well. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Steve Macfield, Mr. McLean, uh, I, I'm sure both of you want to say a few words uh, in relation to Ms. Julian's passing as well. Good morning, um, Mr. For the Record, and good morning to Mr. McLean, and good morning to all your listeners um, listening locally and those that are listening abroad. Yes, uh, um, it's, it shocked me. I didn't um, have any information about her health. I thought she, the last time I saw her, she was very cheerful yes. and, and stuff, and she was a very pleasant, pleasant lady. And um, and my condolence goes out to Mr. Banks and his family and to the other side of the family, the, the Costa side of the family. They are very good friends of mine, too. Cardinal Costa and his brothers and his children are all friends of mine. And I would um, like to send out my condolence to them. It seems to me that we're losing... Um, our people faster than we used to before, and I don't know the reason for that. I wish I'd, I knew, but it seems to me that every every year now, the more of us have fallen than happened in previous year. I remember one time when the death rate was only about three per hundred or two per hundred, three per hundred. Now it's now it's increasing, and um, that increase, of course, it, um, um, it will affect us and. Um, um, I don't know. Um, she was very, very, very young, very vibrant, a, a very personable lady. Um, I had a lot of time for, to, to just talk to her. And I know that Mr. Banks this morning, if you're listening to the radio, I must be um, 
must be distraught because I think that she was um, a really, 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 really uh, um, not only a wife but a great friend and a companion of his. And um, and my condolence really goes out to those to those families. Uh, good morning, O.C. and good morning, Steve. I I too would like to offer my condolences to Loxley and his family, all the relatives and friends of. Julene, it, it's it's really so unfortunate and, and a shock to know that someone as young as her or someone who has accomplished as she has, has simply just departed from us, a uh, lady that has achieved and one more of the soil, you know, it, it, it really... As, as both of you have said, she was such a very nice and pleasant person. And to know that she's gone, and it does seem as if more and more we, we see those of us born of this soil is just, uh, just leaving. And uh, I, I'd truly like to, uh, to express my condolences, my sympathies to Loxley, and I hope that the uh, great comforter will be near him <coughs> as he tries to adjust his life going forward at this time. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you, for that. I just want to make an appeal also to, to the driving public. The roads are wet. When it's raining, uh, your visibility is um, affected as well. There is low visibility. With the rain coming down and those wipers going uh, across your windshield, so you want to be extremely, extremely careful. Those of you who like to tailgate, you want to avoid doing that. Refrain from tailgating uh, because roads are wet, roads are slippery, you need more stopping time. Those of you who still like to fidget with the phones, we know that the law says that you should have a hands-free phone, but driving on the roads, you see many people still on the phones. Uh, you want to refrain from doing that. So with the wet weather, please, please be extremely careful, extra cautious on the roads. Just remember, the life you save may be your own. So, Doc, there are several topics that we wanted to talk about last week and uh, we got so many calls we received so many calls in that we were never able to um, get on track as far as uh, some of the topics uh, were concerned I know we wanted to look into the Chief Justice's uh, decision uh, in relation to the uh, Alric Lindsay case. Um, we also wanted to talk about uh, the uh, UN decolonization colonization, uh, committee you know, as well. And I think that one is so important because people need to know what the UK's obligations under uh, the, uh, as a result of its membership in the United Nations. And as one of those countries that still has a few non-self-governing uh, territories as well. So I think we want to start off talking um, about that one, and we will introduce it. We'll have to take a commercial break in about five minutes, but we, we would like to introduce that um, topic as well. But Ms. Susan is telling us that we have two calls, and of course, or calls, phone calls take priority over everything else here because it is our listening or viewing audience and those who participate in the conversation that make the show what it is. So let's go to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Hello. Good, good morning, caller. Yeah, good morning, Ossie. Good morning to uh, my friend Steve and my friend Gilbert. Good morning. Good morning. I want to. Uh, say so first of all um, you know it's sad to hear about blocking my friend but I will say this that um, a good person a Christian lady mm -hmm. has left us I mean she was she was 
such an inspiration to so many people. And I won't get into, you know, critique and things like that, but I will be talking and talking. But what I want to say this morning, gentlemen, is something I, I saw a miracle last night. And when I talk about a miracle, it had to be a miracle. Nothing, mm-hmm. nothing less. I had went to church in uh, Georgetown, to the Black and Holiness Church in Georgetown. And I had a group, you know, coming back home, when I got down by, um, I took the old Westbury Road and uh, up to Kimpton. Then I got on to the uh, Esla Tibbis Highway. And I got on to the saw this motorcycle. Or I heard it, I didn't see it then. I heard it. And it was long when it shot right by me. And I, I, I went to the say that motorcycle was traveling a minimum of 70 to 80 miles an hour. I mean, it was flying. And I said, as he did that, as he passed me, I said to myself, oh God, I hope you don't pass into anything. I hadn't said that two seconds when I heard up the road. And he had just started to go up the, the bridge now. And I said, oh my God. So I got over there and I pulled over. I saw the bike in the middle of the road and I thought he would have been dead. That's the only thing I could say. And when I looked up, here he is walking across the road, you know. The guy got up and walked across the road. Mm-hmm. Was he riding at, at excessive speed? <laughs> I just told you, when he crossed me, he had to be doing 80. Wow, wow. And when I got up there, I looked at He came across and another guy uh, came out. Uh, he was a little bit ahead of me. So he stopped his car. So the two of us, both of us, got up at the same time. And then that guy, the motorcycle, was in the middle of the of the lane. Um, you know, the two lanes. Cause you got two lanes going up north and south. And he was uh, he was. We picked up the motorbike because we want no accidents to happen. That somebody come up and from the other side didn't see, know it happened. And we took a chance with her, then move the bike out of the thing. And this guy, when I saw him, I was, when I tell you, I was seeing in guys, that he had a little, his right shoulder, like he had scraped it or something, but there was no blood, nothing. And the, the shirt had torn, but he was intact, except for those couple of scratches on his body. And I looked at him and I said, young man, you should, when you, you should get on your knees and thank God. I said, they, he has a purpose for you in this life because you are a miracle. And I just told, told him that. And the other guy came by and the two of them were talking. I guess they knew each other. I didn't know who he was. Neither one of them. But he took him and he put him in his car and I guess he took him home. Mm-hmm. But he'd be leading the bicycle up, the, the motorbike up against the um, the fence on the side there, you know, toward uh, West Bay Beach. But I can't get over it. I mean, I went to bed last and think about this thing, what, how lucky this kid was. Young guy, good looking kid, I didn't know his name, nothing. But okay. I called I called 911 and reported it and told him this had happened. Because I thought when I said, saw it, when I heard the cry, I immediately called 911, <coughs> hope, thinking that the guy was dead or something. No, but it, it was a miracle. That's all I can say. Okay. Got, got you uh, your message there, caller. Thank you very much for that. And we trust that it wasn't just a, adrenaline that was flowing afterwards after he fell, because sometimes that happens. The adrenaline is flowing, and you really don't start to feel the pain until, you know, a few hours, maybe even days afterwards as well. Uh, enough time for the next caller, Miss Susan. Uh, caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Well, hello. Good morning, everyone. I trust you all had a good weekend. Quincy Brown here. Good morning, good morning Quincy. Good morning, I trust Quincy. the same to you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Gilbert. You're silent. Good morning. Oh, no, I said good morning. <laughs> okay, well, perhaps you all said good morning in unison, and I missed it. I, I thought I didn't hear your voice, though. Forgive me. All right, how much time do I have, uh, Mr. Moderator, before you need to take your next commercial Two, mi- two minutes. Right? Two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, dear. All right, let me be as expedient as possible, then I want to firstly send condolences to Mr. Lon Banks, my former boss, director, former director of Radio Cayman, 
in the fact that uh, he's lost his wife. Uh, I send heartfelt condolences to Mr. Banks, the rest of the family on the wife's side. May you all be comforted during this, this time of loss. An excellent wife who can find she's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of grain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. That's the godly woman as spoken of in Proverbs 31, the woman of God. She rises up and she's called blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done exceedingly well, but she surpasses them all. The godly woman found Proverbs 31. All right, in my remaining time, then, Mr. Gilbert, as promised, uh, I said that whenever I called again, I would, I, I would remind the listening public of your thoughts 30 years ago, 29 years ago, uh, as you successfully won the seat on Kim and Brad Little Kim and the election of 1988. And I just want to see how, as a country, particularly here in the Sister Islands, Kim and Brad Little Kim and, how many of these goals we have achieved. You said that we would improve and update, maintain regular and dependable air service to Kim and Brad and Little Kim and by suitable aircraft and development of proper landing facilities in Little Kim and. We have improved their service here on Kim and Brack, absolutely. Little Cayman as well, and I understand that the multi-billionaire magnet will make sure moving forward Little Cayman's airport, which is now a private airport, will become quite international, probably in the next 10 or 15 years from now. Also, you said that uh, your vision was to ensure that all deliberations and considerations, the views and welfare of Kim and Brack and Little Cayman are taking into account in the decision-making process based on the underlying principle of public accountability. You said also the institution of a system of education from preschool to university level, which guarantees every Caymanian the opportunity to achieve education, which is relevant and practical to the individual, which will enable them to make a meaningful contribution to the development of the Cayman Islands. Well, you know what? I have 12 more. I don't have the time as time is of the essence, but I'll pick three more and then I'll conclude. You also said in 1988, Mr. Gilbert, uh, to institute a complete review of our immigration and Caymanian Protection Board law policies and practices. You also said that you would work to institute a national pension scheme to adequately meet the needs of the Caymanian society and to review and update as required. And finally, I, I could go on, you know, but I know time is of the essence. Two minutes have actually expired. <laughs> I see. Two minutes goes quickly. All right. Okay. So with that, I'll thank you, and thank uh, I'll also say I look forward to Mr. Gilbert's response. As we're, we're nation building, I mean, yeah. he has made his contribution. A young man like me, I'm looking at the history now to see where we're going to be 30, 40, 50 years from now, should the world tarry. Uh, and it's good to have something to feed off of. Thank you, Quincy. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Quincy. Uh, folks, for the record, we'll be back shortly. We have to go to a commercial break at this time. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me this morning, two co-hosts, Dr. Steve Markfield and Mr. Gilbert McLean. We're going to introduce the whole issue of decolonization. Uh, the uh, Committee of 24, also known as the Special uh, Committee on uh, Decolonization, a UN uh, committee. And um, we're going to just introduce it because we'll be going to the news in about five minutes' time. And then when we return, hopefully we can get into the meat of the matter. Now, uh, I'll start by giving a definition of the uh, Committee of uh, 24, Special, Special Committee on Decolonization. Uh, here it says, the Special Committee on the Situation with Regard to the Implementation of the Decolon uh, Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples also known as the Special Committee on Decolonization, or the C24, the United Nations entity exclusively devoted to the issue of decolonization, was established in 1961 by the General Assembly with the purpose of monitoring the implementation of the Declaration, uh, which was General Assembly uh, Resolution 1514, of the 14th of December, 1960. Uh, and I should uh, place an asterisk here and say that the United Kingdom is a signatory to that resolution, right? Mm -hmm. Special Committee annually reviews the list of territories 
to which the declaration is applicable and makes recommendations to its implementation. It also hears statements from the non-self-governing territories representatives, uh, dispatches, visiting missions. So I want you to take note of that, what the special committee does. It hears statements from the non-self-governing territories representatives. It dispatches visiting missions. We're going to focus on that one as well, and organizes seminars on the political, social, and economic situation in the territories. Further, the special committee annually makes recommendations concerning the dissemination of information to mobilize public opinion in support of the decolonization process and observes the week of solidarity with the peoples of non-self-governing territory. Tories. Now, one more thing that I would like to uh, put out there is the definition of a non-self-governing uh, territory. And a non-self-governing territory is defined as a territory whose people have not yet attained a full measure of self-government. In 1946, several UN member states identified a number of territories under their administration that were non-self-governing and placed them on a UN list. The Cayman Islands, as well as all of the British overseas territories and some other territories as well, are listed as non-self-governing territories. With that, Dr. McPhail, I'd like you to just say a few comments before we go to our uh, headline news. Well, um, or it, you know, it's it's very timely that you bring this um, this this um, this item on your show today. And I have been fighting this thing since for 50 years now. Um, I think as an old Pantonite, um, that means uh, someone who followed Mr. Armand Panton in and then and and then and, and, and self determination and his and his and his advent for self determination and for internal self government. I have, I had, I had, um. Been following that ever since I was maybe eighteen or nineteen or years old, and fifty years ago, when I was a student at the at the Vancouver City College, part of the University of British Columbia, I wrote a letter. Um, supporting Mr. Ormond's, um quest for internal self-government, I wrote a letter to the United, to this the, um, this committee, um, this special committee for um, uh, decolonization committee. I wrote a letter saying that I was um, in favor of granting uh, um, internal self-government to full internal self-government to the Cayman Islands. My letter was was um, accepted by the by the committee. And it was generated. It was circulated all through the United Nations as a petition from an individual from the Cayman Islands. And as a young man, I thought that that would 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 help me to propel the information in the Cayman Islands islands. And what it did, it brought miseries to me that I never thought could happen. One of the things that the government said at the time that I would never be welcome back to to this country. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Steve McField. That's a good introduction to that. And I just want to say very quickly that uh, when I was doing my master's degree and in doing my research uh, on the United Nations and the Decolonization Committee, that is when I first came across that. That would have been in the late 70s when I first came across the fact that you had made that uh, appeal to the United Nations as well. Please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back after or eight o'clock news good morning and welcome back to for the record we have one caller on hold so we're going to go straight to the phone lines caller good morning welcome to for the record good morning Jose, and good morning dr mcfeel and good morning gilbert good, good morning. morning good, good morning, morning sir. this is rupert e. banks uh, morning, morning roops i'm calling to express my sympathy to Mr. Banks and his family and so the the costers 
and to the Sims. Joya was my good friend. Yes. And, um, you know, it looked uh, like Dr. Matthew said, look, I'll be going fast all the time. Mm-hmm. Every every day or so is a couple that we do, that we have known uh, for practical all our lives. They too have gone. Um, yeah, I just I just want to express my sympathy to them and um, pray that God will comfort them in their time of sorrow and that He will bless us all. Thank, thank you for this. Thank you for listening to me. Thank, thank you very thank much, Roop. Thank, thank you very much, Roop. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Rupert said. Uh, the family of uh, Joey, uh, Big Joe, some of us refer to him as as well, and our uh, condolences go out to, to that family also. Um, yes. uh, Miss Melanie, who's the um, head of uh, uh, protocol in the uh, cabinet office as well. Um, gentlemen, in discussing the decolonization committee, I think it is instructive for us to uh, look at uh, Her Majesty's government, the UK's government current policy towards the UN Decolonization Committee. This may take a little while, but I, uh, uh, I'm reading here from uh, a memorandum by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and um, this was a letter submitted in response to a letter from the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. That that, that is the UK Foreign Affairs Committee. And I'm, I'm just finding this online, so I'm unable to printed to share with uh, with you, but it it, it gives the history of the um, decolonization committee, and then it goes on to talk about, it says, under the UN Charter, the UK as an administering power is to ensure, amongst other things, that OT's political, economic, and social development and the development of their self-government territories uh, are comes off the UN list of non-self-governing uh, territories, which is called delisting, once they have been deemed to have achieved, quote, a full measure of self-government, not partial, a full measure of self-government. The Committee of 24 has a role in recommending territories for delisting. This issue has been a point of much dispute between the administering powers and the Committee of 24, which is the Decolonization Committee. Uh, it goes on to say the committee has 29 members listed. At the end of the uh, memorandum, none of the four remaining administering powers, the UK, France, New Zealand, and the US, are members of the Decolonization Committee. Neither are there any EU or Western group estate uh, group state members on the committee. France and New Zealand both formally participate in the committee's work in respect of their territories. The U.S. does not. Didn't say anything about the U.K. But, uh, and then here's the background on the U.K.'s historic p- uh, position towards the U.N. Decolonization Committee. And uh, this may correct something that I said earlier about the U.K. being a signatory, but it, it will clarify it, actually, rather than mm-hmm. correct it. It says, despite uh, abstaining on the decolonization of the granting of, uh, on the declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, and the General Assembly resolution setting up the C-24, the UK agreed to join and cooperate with the Committee of 24. This it did until 1971, when it left the committee. The UK was concerned at that time uh, by the committee's recent adoption, adopted program of action to implement uh, 1514, that is the uh, resolution Mm -hmm. 1514, uh, its reluctance to address the issue of small territories as well as its unfavorable composition. In 1974, the UK resumed cooperation with the committee without rejoining. The U.S. and France were not members either. However, by mid-1985, again frustrated at the committee's work, the U.K. decided to cease cooperation with effect from January 1986, 
while reserving the right to participate in the C-24's debate on the Falklands. In a letter to the then C-24 chair, the UK permanent representative in New York explained the UK's decision on the grounds that the territories which remain in close association with the UK had chosen to do so, that this was unlikely to change in the near future, that the UK and its then uh, and its then dependent territories therefore considered the colonial era over, and hence the U. And interest in these territories affairs should cease. That gentleman, remember the, uh, that date uh, is very important there, right? Could you read in, that in, again? In, in 1974, the UK resumed cooperation with the committee without rejoining. The US and France were not members either. However, by mid-1985, middle of 1985, Again, frustrated at the committee's work, the UK decided to cease cooperation with effect from January 1986. Refused, uh, decided that it would cease cooperation from January 1986 while reserving the right to participate in the C-24's debate on the Falkland Islands, because remember, uh, the oh, yeah. Falkland War uh, 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 had taken place before. In a letter to the then C-24, Chair, 24 chair, the UK permanent, UK's permanent representative in New York explained the UK's decision on the ground, that is not to participate, on the grounds that the territories which remained in close association with the UK had chosen to do so, that this was unlikely to change in the near future, and that the UK and its then dependent territories therefore considered the colonial era over, and hence the UN's interest in these territory affairs should cease. UK <laughs> policy evolved again by the mid-1990s when it resumed some informal cooperation with the C-24, although the UK did not participate in formal committee meetings. In 1999, the UK policy became one of informal dialogue on delisting, informal, not formal dialogue, informal dialogue. The UK started informally discussing with successive C-24 chairs the uh, possible modalities for delisting its overseas territories. Despite much discussion and even a C-24 visit to Bermuda in 2005, these efforts came to nothing and no territory has been delisted. Since then, the UK has maintained informal cooperation with C-24. It attends C-24 meetings, but does not sit in the UK seat, nor make any statements. Councillors from the Falkland Islands address the committee annually to put forward their case. Representatives of the Gibraltar government have also petitioned the committee. The UN continues, however, to be frustrated that the C-24's resolutions on the overseas territories do not properly reflect developments in the territories, including their wish to retain links to the UK, not, nor explicitly acknowledge the Falkland Islanders or Gibraltar's right to self-determination. And this is the UK saying, our position of informal cooperation allows the UK to maintain a dialogue with the chair of the 20, C-24, as well as C-24 members when resolutions on UK overseas territories are considered by the UN General Assembly's fourth committee. The UK also takes full advantage of the opportunities provided to make statements, explanations of votes and uh, positions, as well as rights to reply, most recently in October 2010. Uh, the, the UK voted against tax calling for member states to intensify their efforts to continue to implement 
a plan of action for the second international decade for the eradication of colonialism and use those efforts as the basis for a plan of action for the next decade and urging members states to do their utmost to promote effective measures for the full and speedy implementation of the declaration in all non-self-governing territories to which the declaration applied. The UK argued that the proposals for the third international decade and the uh, 50th anniversary of the decolonization declaration were unacceptable as the text failed to recognize the progress made in the relationship between the United Kingdom and its territories. I'm going to stop there just and just basically to uh, summarize uh, the fact that obviously what I have read there, the uh, relationship between the decolonization committee, the uh, committee of 24 and the UK has not been great. And Dr. McFeel, you can attest to that in terms of your um, involvement and your presentations that you have, uh, you, you, you have made uh, towards them. The, we will also talk about efforts by the UN decolonization committee to have um, meetings here in the Cayman Islands up most recently until 2011 when it was rejected and I know for a fact that the British government at that time dis encouraged the Cayman Islands not to hold the meetings here. There were issues with that about um, the, the whole state not being uh, informed in time and everything else but we know that that happened and of course all some of you may remember the Vinabubu case in the, in the 70s when <clears throat> you know uh, all sort of propaganda was sprayed about him and what he was coming to the Cayman Islands to give the Cayman Islands independence and everything yep. hence, hence we have never never embraced the opportunities that we have had to uh, be represented or represent ourselves in the decolonization committee's discussions, Dr. McField. As it as it stated there, the last representation that came and had before the UN a decolonization committee was in 2010 when I appeared and represented the Cayman Islands. Since that time, there has been no representation um, before the UN decolonization committee, and in fact, because of the representation that that I made at 2010. Um, and the history that I gave them ab 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 about the reasons why we had not wanted to um, to 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 engage um, in in any further um, in any further um, decolonization of, of of the Cayman Islands, they decided that they would have the meeting. The next meeting um, for the decolonization committee would be in Cayman. Cayman yeah. That was 2011, and they it and 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 it it is utter nonsense. And 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 stuff to say that that the the, the the territory was 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 not aware that 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 the UN um, decolonization committee wanted to have their meetings here. From I, I would say from April that year they were notified that 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 they that they um they were intended to hold a meeting here, but for some reasons the government of the day did not want the UN, UN committee to come here to hold a meeting because they did not want the people in the Cayman Island to participate. They did not want them to be informed about what intent, internal self-government means. And, and it's, it's very, it's very um, unfortunate that our government since then, since then, for, seven, for, 17, for seven years, has never sent anyone to the UN meetings at all. They have never sent anyone. The last meeting they, that the the UN decolonization had was in Nicaragua last year, and they they held a meeting in Nicaragua last year, and not so. In fact, it wasn't even publicized in Cayman that that the decolonization committee was having a meeting in the in the Caribbean in the in the in the region. The next the meeting this year is supposed to be in one of the Caribbean territories too. It's not the the um the they have not named the territory yet because it's still early because it's still July. Usually it's still August. Usually it's July, August. Usually the the meeting is not until o October in November, and usually it, it, it takes about two months, two months and a half before they before they actually um before they actually um decide on which territories is going to be. Mm -hmm. But they it, it it's already decided that 
the next meeting of the decolonization committee is going to be in the Caribbean area. And why we do not want to um, the, the the United Nations decolonization committee to, to 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 have more information about us and for us to participate? Well, you know the reasons why. Um, the reasons why is that we're scared, and that's and that brings me to that brings me to all of the rhetoric that you hear from Mr. Andrew Rez, Rezendel about um, Cayman Islands and, and the other territories should have a representative at the United Kingdom Parliament. That's one of the reasons why. Because because although they do not want us to um to to to, to give us internal self government, um in which we will run our own internal affairs, they now say and to and to, to but to get us delisted as the, you as 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 because if, once we delisted, then we, we we do not appear in that committee as being a non self governing territory. Okay, we're going to take a <clears throat> a commercial break now. When we return, the conversation will continue with Dr. Steve Macfield and Mr. Gilbert McLean. We're discussing the UN Decolonization Committee, the UK's position, and uh, the Cayman Islands uh, activity uh, as far as the UN Decolonization Committee is concerned. Please stay tuned. Press the pause button if you need to, but don't change the dial. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me this morning, two co my two co-hosts, Dr. Steve McFeel and uh, Mr. Gilbert McLean. We're discussing the UN Decolonization Committee. We have given you um, its remit, uh, given you a historical perspective on the UN Decolonization Committee, and uh, we have also uh, pointed out to you the UK's position as far as the U uh, Decolonization Committee is concerned. We now want to talk about uh, meetings that should have been held, uh, were planned to be held here in the Cayman Islands. There were two Cayman uh, news service stories, one pointing out to welcoming the fact that um, the UN Decolonization Committee would hold a meeting here in the Cayman Islands. And then there's another article pointing out that it never took place. And I'm going to ask Mr. Gilbert McLean to share that article with us. Uh, yes, thank you, Osi. The This is from Cayman News Service, and it is titled, Mac Turns Down UN Invite. Uh, it, it reads, the Cayman Islands Premier has turned down an invitation to host the United Nations Special Committee on Decolonization annual seminar here. His office revealed on Tuesday, despite a release from the United Nations stating that the meeting would be held in Cayman next month, officials from the Premier's office said that McKeever Bush had written to Committee Chairman Francisco Carrion Mina on Tuesday morning stating that it would not be possible for his government to host the meeting. Although no reason have reasons have been given as to why Cayman is refusing the invitation, officials said the Cayman Islands government had never agreed to have it here in the first place. The U United Nations, quote, had jumped the gun, end quote, when it said the meeting would be held in Cayman, officials added. Uh, the editor's note, according to the United Nations sources, the United Nations Special Committee on Decolonization formally decided to accept the invitation from the United Kingdom to hold the UN Caribbean Regional Seminar on Decolonization. It was unclear whether the Cayman Islands government had been informed in advance by the United Kingdom that it was going to extend the invitation to the United Nations. According to an international decolonization expert, the last seminar held in a UK administered territory was in Anguilla in 2003 even as the United Kingdom has withdrawn its formal cooperation from the committee in 1986. The expert went on to note that the French facilitated the Pacific Regional Seminar on Decolonization in its territory of New Caledonia 
in 2010. In his letter to the United Nations Committee Chair, the Premier reportedly offered his appreciation and gratitude for the invitation to host the annual meeting, but turned it down without explanation. Okay. Now, Dr. McField, uh, you attended the uh, meeting in New Caledonia, I believe, right? right? And that is what you were referring to earlier when the decision was made uh, for it to be held there. Now, in in that meeting in New Caledonia, uh, the administering power, the UK representatives, were at that meeting as well? They were, too. They were at that meeting. Of course, they were at that meeting. And... um, and of course, I had my instructions from the, from the from the government, the cabinet. Because remember, I was representing the Kimberlands government. I mm-hmm. had my instructions, and my instructions went to the fact that we had had a new constitution that had just uh, been 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 enacted in in, in, in uh, two thousand and nine, and that we wanted to see how it worked. We wanted to have to to work it to to our advantage. Mm-hmm. And in that in in the, in, in those respects, we did not want to embark on any. Um, further advancement at that time. Um, it was pointed out to me by some of the countries, um, New Zealand, Australia, and, and some of those other places um, um, that, um, um, that, that, um, that we, were, we had a stable government, we had the highest GDP in the Caribbean, most in the world, and that we had a stable government, we had a stable um, political system, and that we were a prime candidate for for further um, for 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 the in, internal self government for for their for for the decolonization, and they say that they were not satisfied with just my mere statement that I had read that uh, that had given to me by the by the by the cabinet, and I then went took an hour and a half and and, and gave them a history of the Cayman Islands and how we had gotten to to this point in time, and that's when they were very impressed and they say that they would like to. Hold a seminar. They, they they decided to hold a seminar in 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 the, in the Cayman Islands the next year, and of course that never happened. That 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 never happened. And the paradox, the paradox that 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 um which 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 exists now is that on the one hand we have all of these human rights committees and and all that sort of stuff. The rights of gay people, the rights of uh, all kinds of people that, that people are people are fighting for, and we do not have the rights of the Caymanian people for full internal self government to to run their own affairs. That's the paradox that 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 that, that we face every day, and um, and it seems to me that there are there is a faction in the Cayman Islands who do not want the Caymanian people to advance any further than they're doing, and that. And that they are not interested in educating the Cayman and people of their full potential to run their own affairs, and and that and 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 so so it seems to me that every time the United Nations or any other any any other international body comes into the country to educate us to to make the people understand that 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 there's an alternative to what's going on, they are shunned and they are shut out and they are and and and, and they are not welcome. Okay, well, you know. Steve, and from from my perspective, I have always been anti-colonial. I will never be. I never was. I will never be because I I find no great thrill or believe that there is human progression in one uh, group of people in an industrialized country by uh, any particular nationality having dominion and the last word over the affairs of another country. Dominance and control. And uh, the, the, the fact that the Cayman Islands is a country, unlike what a certain lawyer here wrote about a couple of years ago saying that we are not a country, maybe he should check the Oxford Dictionary on, on, on political uh, theory and really see that a country is not limited by blinkers which he had on, but that Cayman is indeed a a country because of a a, a certain culture, certain custom, certain language, and so on. The Cayman Islands is a country, and that is recognized by the United Nations and the fact that all countries of the world should have its its own uh, ability to run its own affairs. Okay. So you know, I I have the the Cayman Islands. I I think. I'm a Caymanian. I'm, I'm eight generations Caymanian. And it is pitiful what happens in this country. So that 
in, in 2011 that the United Nations uh, Decolonization Committee could not even hold a meeting here where perchance a few people would listen and understand and realize I'm not surprised, you know, the people who own this country are, are the people who have come here with lots of money in many instances or have come here and earned lots of money who controls this country one way or the other. You find them, they live in the in law firms, they live in accounting firms and, and uh, in certain big businesses here and whatnot. Those are the people who own this country and they owned governments as such. When I say own, I mean that now in the biggest, and that they haven't purchased them, but in the bigger picture where the governments cater to the wishes of, of, of these corporations. Okay. And that's, that's the way it is. And who suffers? The average citizen. Okay, thank you very much for that. Just a little housekeeping. We are informed that all systems, phones, and systems are down at the immigration department and they may be down for uh, quite a while, some uh, technical issues that they may be experiencing there. So we want to put that out to the uh, to the general public. Hope they're not hacked. Uh, hopefully, after lunch, they will have, they will be operational again, but all phones and systems are down, so there's very limited service being offered by the immigration department. Let's take a commercial break, and when we return, I will read for you the UK's statement on the uh, UN Decolonization Committee in October of 2010 that was read by the Deputy Permanent Representative for the UK in the United Nations. Please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. We have three callers on hold, so we're going to go to the phone lines. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, sir. How are you? Oh, see, Dr. Steve. And Good morning. I'm Bill McLean. I went here. Good morning. First of all, I want to have my condolences to my good friend Loxley and his family. Um, he was a schoolmate of mine. Um, his wife was one of my next door neighbors when I was living on Henning Lane. So there's a great loss. And I can pray for him. But I know he pull out of it. The Lord knows best. Uh, you got a very um, an important topic this morning. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to listen in on much of it. But I want to run my little piece. The last time they came here, they had a meeting at Mayor Miller Hall. Dr. Steve and Arnold McLean, I think all two of you were there, that I asked a simple question. If if we can have the same constitution of Bermuda, because it was, was spread that there wouldn't be no more Bermuda constitution. And the answer the head man gave me or us, unite, you England is a part of the United Nations, and if they gave Bermuda that, they would have to give us the same thing. That they, that the answer they gave us that night. Mm -hmm. There's not nothing wrong with we talking about advancing, and they people should encourage, be encouraged to come here, and I believe they might even fund some of the meetings and stuff that we should be having. To tell, to enlighten our people about the steps forward because we should be should be preparing for it. That's my little piece and I have to go back to work and keep up the good work and I get a chance to listen a little bit. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Ivan, for that. Well put, well put. <laughs> and next caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Yes, good morning. How are you? Uh, fine, sir. How are you? Good morning. Yes, good morning to Mr. McLean and Dr. Mockfield. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Um, it marks some here call it from the day uh from Kevin Brown. Uh, I have a complaint to make. And that's about a building that is in front of the police station up here that 
the roof is falling out. All the shingles is, is coming over into our property. And the, the, the building is in disres, disrepair. The building was in that condition from Hurricane Paloma. And it seems as if like nobody is paying no attention to that, not even the people that work there. And it's harboring a lot of rodents. And it's a, it's a hazard to our uh, production in, the, in our bakery. And I would like if you, uh, OC, could pass on that message to somebody that you think that might influence someone up here to get repairs done on this building because it's a hazard. Please do that for me, please, sir. Okay. Have you approached anyone at district administration in this regard? Uh, I don't intend to approach none of them because I've set up appointments with them to see them for I don't know how many times. Mm -hmm. no, they always say, oh, we'll give, give, give you a call, we'll give you a call. I don't have no more time to be used to make an appointment for them. Okay. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, caller. Uh, next caller, caller. Good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, OC. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? And good, fine. And good morning to your panel. Good morning. Good morning. I I just want to say, um, at the airport, we need more officers at the airport. Up there is crazy on Saturdays and Sundays. We got a few officers who come there and they will walk this thing into the bone. We got others who will come there and just sit on their phone and do absolutely nothing when it comes to helping clear the traffic up. I just want to ask the um, whoever it is, um, the government, um, tourism or the airport, CIAA, how come we don't have any signs up there saying where is departure and where is arrival temporary even though the airport is being built on? And on the right-hand side of the airport, where you could park at one point in time, you can't park anymore because of the construction. Is not one sign saying there, no parking. That airport is a chaos. I don't know how these people who are building this airport not coming up there. The, the, not the, construct, the construction guys. The people who have them in charge to build the airport to come up there like CIAA or Tourism Board or whoever the person may be to see what's happening up there on a Saturday and a Sunday. Oh, see, up there is crazy. I know we're building the airport. Don't get me wrong. Don't read me wrong. That Just that we to... need more bodies up there to keep that traffic flowing. And those CIAA and many more other people should just come there on a Sunday and just sit for two hours and observe what's happening up there because a lot of people is getting flustrated, um, finger pushing and, and crushing up each other and throwing a butt at each other and, and telling you they're going to stay here, they ain't moving, all that kind of stuff. We need two more officers with what we got up there because then when they get under that tent by departure, it is hard to get them moved. They're afraid of the rain. They're afraid of the sun, and they're constantly on their phone. You got very few. So, do you think that they need you? You think they need actual police officers, or couldn't the civil aviation uh, or the airports authority uh, Air have additional staff out there to help with the traffic um, um, d direction of traffic as well? They got some authorities up there from say who's helping with traffic, but they've been there for a while and like they just disappeared. They're all hanging around by the departure. What about arrival? Arrival is crucial as well as um, departure. They need to share their time. They're not sharing it properly. It's not being shared properly. And you have to really be there to see it. And I'm not the only one complaining, not because I'm a driver up there, but up there's a chaos on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm just asking whoever's in charge, please come up there and observe and take notes to see how we can get this thing working better until this airport is finished built. Okay. We need some temporary signs. Well, we trust, that, some, uh, we trust that people are listening. If not, uh, we will try to get on to uh, the either the operations manager or, or, or someone else as well. So thank you very much for that caller. Okay, I'm going to read now the UN, uh, the UK statement to the UN's fourth committee on Nelson non-self-governing territories in October 2010, and this is what the deputy permanent representative for the UK at the United Nations says. It reads, the British government's relationship with its overseas territories is a modern one based on partnership, 
shared values, and the right of each territory to determine whether it wishes to stay linked to the United Kingdom or not. The United Kingdom has no intention of imposing independence against the will of the people concerned. Where independence is an option and is the clear and constitutionally expressed wish of the people of the territories, the British government will give every help and encouragement to those territories to achieve it. For as long as the UK's overseas territories wish to retain the link to the United Kingdom, the British government will remain committed to their future development and continued security. When considering how the UK can best defend its overseas territory's interest in the United Nations, any potential option must support the UK's primary objective in this regard. The primary, those primary objectives are listed as to ensure that our sovereignty over the overseas territories is respected and that the rights of the people of the overseas territories to self-determination is respected. This one is interesting to uphold the constitutional settlements that we have reached or may wish to reach with our overseas territories and to protect the interests and democratic rights of their populations and wow. also to ensure the UK's relationship with the overseas territories are, are presented in the most accurate light. So they call our constitutional uh, um, agreement or constitution to call it a settlement, a settlement that yes. we settled with them yeah. on that uh, you know so what usually when you settle an issue there are competing sides yes. and you find some medium ground or something like that where both sides supposedly are happy in the, in the other one in relation to talking about this um, sovereignty um, um, of them I can understand that statement to uh, sense that Gibraltar and the Falkland Islands fall into that equation. And of course, we know the challenges that Gibraltar has with um, you know, the Spanish, uh, Spain's claim over Gibraltar and uh, Argentina's claim over the Falklands or Las Malvinas, as they refer to them as. We're gonna talk more about this when we return. Press the pause button if you need to, but don't change the dial for the record. We'll be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me, Dr. Steve McField, Mr. Gilbert McLean. We're discussing the role of the United Nations Decolonization Committee, the UK's position in respect of its overseas territories, and specifically the UK's position in respect of uh, the Cayman Islands uh, and our approach to the UN Decolonization um, Committee. Uh, it is quite obvious, gentlemen, that the relationship between the Decolonization Committee and the United Kingdom is not harmonious in, 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 in any regard. Uh, the UK has taken a defensive position when it comes to uh, say about its overseas territories um, and uh, obviously are pushing back as much as they can when it comes to the Decolonization Committee trying to make moves to ensure that their mandate um, is, is uh, carried out, you know, as well. The, what, what, uh, before I hand over to you, my observation in this is that the UK, a lot of talk, but at the same time, they have really not prepared its overseas territories, gotten them anywhere to the point where they may want to consider the right of self-determination or to consider independence because they want to keep the overseas territories in the position that they are in. More so, more so now that we see the Brexit situation and they're having to leave the European Union. And we have seen more talk now about dialogue with the overseas territories and how we're so important to them, so much more important to them now. 
hand over to you, Chairman. Yeah, and all right. If you look at what at, at what they in the in the statement that they uh, they made to the um, decolonization committee in 2010. Look at what they said first. It says, when considering how the UK can best defend its overseas territories' interests in the UN, any potential option must support the UK's primary pro- objective, uh, the UK's um, um, interest in the UK's, and any potential option must support the UK's primary objectives in this regard. And then it says, to ensure that our sovereignty over the overseas territories is respected and that the rights of the people the people of the overseas territory of the overseas territory is it, to self-determination self-determination is, is respected, respected. Yeah. the first rights that they said is the overseas sovereignty rights yes. is to be respected mm-hmm. that come first and foremost first that and is foremost. first and paramount mm-hmm. and second to that is the, then the overseas countries and territories so it seems to me that so it seems to me that there's a complete um um disparity between what the United Nations believe that the overseas countries' territory should, should be seeking and what the United Kingdom said, said they should be seeking. And when you look at the latest uh, communication from the United Nations this year, mm-hmm. and when you look at it, it says... And that's dated That's dated uh, sometime in June of this year, I That's believe. right. Oh, yeah, June okay. of this year. And it says, and it says here, also a form that in the process of decolonization in the Cayman Islands, there is no alternative to the principle of self-determination, which is also a fundamental human rights as recognized under the relevant under the relevant human rights conventions. So the while while the while the, the the United Nations has one view of the rights of Caymanians, the UK has a different view. The, the UK's view is their sovereignty must be respected over and beyond the rights of the Caymanian people. Mm-hmm. So that is one view. And then it goes on to say, to ensure that the UK's relationship with its overseas territories are presented in the most accurate light. Well, how can it be presented in the most accurate light when we do not know what the United Kingdom's relationship is? If the constitution, which is to give us rights, are a settlement. It's a contra- It's a complete contradiction in law and in politics. I t- always thought that a constitution was the highest law on behalf of the people. And the aspirations and the of aspirations the of the people, yeah. not a settlement uh-huh. between two parties. Because a settlement between two parties means that there are differences and people have settled them. And so here is the contradiction now. And I would like to hear what Mr. McLean has to say about that. Mr. McLean. Well, I, I think you have you have clearly stated it, uh, Steve. It, it's, it's saying that, as I understand it, that, you know, wh- wh- whosever position it is that the United Nations uh, must look at, it's that of the United Kingdom first and foremost. That it, 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 must, be, it must be theirs and what is good for us must be interpreted as what they are putting forward as their position. And and the only way that that is going to change is if by accident in another 50 years uh, that there are enough people in this country to realize that there is an inalienable right of every people of every country to be in charge of its own affairs and that we will develop enough pride as we went to the graves with our older uh, folks that, you know, we are smart enough, wise enough, and ambitious enough to know what is best for us. You, you're talking about uh, a middle person, for example, representation to see that, the, that they, these islands are represented at the United Nations. You mean to tell me that we are not capable of doing that ourselves. And if the United Nations is to know what we really want, is it any better or clearer way of doing that in hearing from us? I don't think so. And that, and, and, that, and let me give you an example of what you just said, Mr. McLean. Just take, for instance, this matter in the paper this morning about the fire service. Yeah. 
That's a, that is a that is a simple ex, simple example. Yeah. Here we have a fire service in which we develop over 50 years, more than 50 years. We develop it ourselves over 50 years. And, and may and, I just interrupt you? Let's not forget that that was the one department in government that we, with pride, always pointed to. Total Cayman. Every person in that was a Caymanian. Yes. I bet you didn't that And way today, no more. it's in disarray. And who and who we have hating it? We have somebody who's not Caymanians. Don't you want to tell me that we cannot, we, we do not have the ability to, to, to run that ourselves as we have been doing for 50 odd years? Of course mm -hmm. not. The huh? natives are not huh? smart enough. And we call that so, progress. And we call that progress. So <laughs> that is one example that I want to give your listeners of what, of what we mean when we talk about self-determination. Mm -hmm. That is one example of self-determination that, that, that has gone wrong because we they say that we don't we are not capable of doing it after we have been doing it 50 years and more okay we have one caller let's go to the phone lines caller good morning welcome to for the record uh good morning caller welcome to for the record yes sir good morning uh, to y'all good, good morning. morning good morning yeah i would like to back up the the caller that I just called a while ago i also experienced that uh, like i've said um before, you know, I've, I've seen them as, you know, un unequipped, not equipped at all, you know, um, stand up on the phone, you know, lean up on the poles and not paying attention to anything. You're is. talking about officers at the airport? Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's really a problem, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They need to get out there and... and, and look around you know yeah my experience has been completely different every time that I have uh, been there there's always an officer there ensuring that you uh, as soon as you pull in to uh, drop off someone that you you don't hang around that you move because there's limited space for uh, people especially in the departure area as well uh, but that's not to say that what is being um, expressed is, is is not incorrect because there are different officers there at various times during the day yeah, that's something. From time to do a good job, you know, but some of them are really um, ridiculous, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it, and it, anything can occur, and they're not equipped at all. A lot of times they're just wearing the belt, or they're just wearing a radio and a pair of handcuffs, and then it, anything can occur. You know, a fight or a terrorist attempt, attack or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And they're really not prepared to put a job a lot of time, you know. Okay. Do, do, do you, uh, Carla, believe that maybe it is time to have airport police officers who are maybe come under the command of the um, commissioner of police but are assigned specifically for port duties? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and especially the tree as, as well. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you got to remember that we can't carry a firearm. So I, I, I at least give them elite special training, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Colin. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any more calls, Ms. Susan? No calls. Uh, before we take the uh, break, uh, you gentlemen, uh, uh, Dr. Steve and uh, Mr. McLean, you know, talked about this whole issue of the um, sovereignty over the UK, uh, over the overseas territories that the UK wishes to retain. Um, I personally believe that they're talking more, this is a, um, a vague reference or uh, what the Americans would uh, talk about, um, a dog whistle uh, in relation to the Falklands and to uh, Gibraltar. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. It could, it could be talking about, you don't question, you know, what we, you know, uh, we, we have control over these. We won the, these islands during the war and whatever. You don't question that. Bear in mind, in our Constitution, they express, well, I, I, maybe I'll call it a settlement. In our settlement with the UK in 2009, since they refer to it that way, I'll call it that way. In our settlement with them in 2009, in that document, it also talks about that the UK will look 
after the interests of the people of the Cayman Islands as long as those interests do not conflict with the interests of the UK. Again, pointing out that the UK's interests are first and foremost and paramount. That's right. That's right. Yep. Let's take a commercial break. For the record, we'll be back shortly. We'll have about another 15 minutes to chat with you. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me this morning, Dr. Steve Macfield and Mr. Gilbert McLean. I'm referring now to a draft uh, resolution which was uh, submitted by the chair of the D. Uh, colonization committee, the special committee on the situation with regard to the implementation of the declaration on granting of independence to colonial countries and people. And just to say also that while the remit of the decolonization committee is for that, they have no qualms with the administering powers getting to a situation where the people of those territories are happy and pleased with the situation that they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. I can only speak for myself and speak for uh, you know some of my friends who talk about these things, and we are certainly not happy with the relationship that we have with the UK at this point in time. We have heard it um, verbalized on this talk show in terms of uh, you know, resentment that people have in terms of the way that the UK handle things. We have seen it in our debate when it comes to the issue of gay marriages. We have seen it in the issue of the um, imposition of the death penalty, where the United Kingdom, by order in council, um, removed the death penalty, you know, from, from our uh, legislation. So it is not an ideal situation that we have with the UK. And just merely the granting of independence is not the only objective of the special committee. Exactly. Dr. McField. Yes, it's not the only, and, and in fact it says that it's, it's not the special exam. Now let's go on to see what it, um, what it says. It says, having considered the question of the Cayman Islands, having examined the relevant chapter of the report of the special committee on the situation with regard to the implementation of the Declaration on the Drafting of Independence to Colonial Countries and People for 2016 related to the Cayman Islands. Taking note of the working paper prepared by the Secretariat on the Cayman Islands and other relevant information, and recognizing that all available options for self-determination of the territory are valid as long as they are in accordance with the freely expressed wishes of the people of the Cayman Islands, and conformity with the clearly defined principles contained in General Assembly Resolution 15, 15, 14, 15 of 14, of 14 December 1960, of an 1960 and other resolutions of the Assembly, expressing concerns that 56 years after the adoption of the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples, there still remains 17 non-self-governing territories including the Cayman Islands. And conscious of the importance of continuing the effective implementation of the declaration taking into account the target set by the United Nations to eradicate colonialism by 2020 and the plans of action for the second and third international decades for the eradication of co colonialism. I'm going to stop you there for a minute, Dr. Yes. Mark Field, because again, it is more the objective to eradicate yes, colonialism yes. in all its forms yes. and manifestations yes. as opposed to the the sole objective of, of granting in, independence, independence yes. Uh, yes. you know, yeah. as yes. well. And yeah. as yes. the taxman always says, we have to recognize that we are still a colony of the United Kingdom. Yes. We can call it whatever we want to call it, overseas That's territories, right. dependent territories, we are still a colony. We are colonized yep. by them. We have one caller. We're going to allow this last caller in for the morning. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I really appreciate what you guys are talking about today. And um, I'd like to say that even though uh, the people of the territory may be sort of content, generally speaking, mm -hmm. with the 
um, relationship between the United Kingdom and the Cayman Islands, calling it a settlement is, I think, propaganda. <laughs> and it is clear, clearly aimed at manipulating this population into thinking that we have something modern. We don't. Because wow. we, we, could, we could sort of be content with what uh, with the relationship. But if you were to put the question to the United Nations to say, does the, re- the political relationship between the United Kingdom and the Cayman Islands meet that um, of the um, United Nations uh, objective of eradicating colonialism, they would say no, because we have an unequal relationship, one in which we are subordinate mm-hmm. to them, mm-hmm. exactly. to their... To their um, absolute discretionary power, right? And that cannot by any measure be, be measured uh, or determined to be modern. That, my friend, is nothing but colonialism in its purest form. Yeah. I, I can say more, but I'll leave it there. For, uh, one more thing before I go. Sure. The, United, the, 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 the situation in the, in the United Kingdom right now is that um, the UN right now is that they have cha- they have changed um, the the vote so it's no longer one vote for for the overseas for the non self governing territories there are now a separate vote for each one okay so so whereas we used to have more friends fighting for us because we were in the same boat now they can work out their own arrangements. And we better be careful because we can be left behind in a very terrible situation. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, sick. caller. And I, I know that you, you, you share an interest in, in that. As a matter of fact, one of those um, articles that we spoke about, uh, Cayman News Service, made reference to, to that caller and his welcoming you know, of that meeting that was supposed to take place in 2011 here in the Cayman Islands. Gentlemen, uh, in, as they say in the Legislative Assembly, we've meet, uh, reached the, uh, the uh, hour of hour interruption. Of interruption. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give uh, Mr. McLean first an opportunity for some cl- closing comments and then Dr. McField. Well, uh, I just want to thank you, O.C., for uh, extending the invitation to be here. Uh, with you on the show when, until uh, Mrs. Pitcairn returns. And uh, the fact that here and on this show, uh, it it's dedicated to discussing things that really matter and things which in many instances are not spoken about except here. And hopefully it the, the discussion uh, will lead at some point in time to uh, a greater awareness and a greater motivation, uh, and particularly uh, the, the the people of, of this country that's affected by this particular uh, style and, and way of governance will see that if somebody can, other than you, can ultimately decide what happens to you, it's not necessarily the very best thing for you. So... Uh, once again, uh, I thank you for the opportunity of being here and being able to discuss these things. And thank you for, for uh, doing so as well. Doc? I think, uh, O.C., that the basic fare of, um, of, of, of going, going and doing things on your own and making your own mistakes, trial and error, um, is still, it's still on change in this country. It seems to me that the neo, um, um, neo-colonialists and the neocons um, are afraid to educate the people of their fundament, fundamental human rights, which um, the United Nations and other people around the world um, have, have, have been touting for, for, they say, over 50 years now. Um, I don't think anything has changed much in the time that I start fighting this this battle 50 odd years ago, or when Mr. Ormond's panel started before me and other Caymanians who have fought this battle, I believe that um, without education, um, we are not going to win this battle without without education about who we are and where we where we are now and where we want to go. 
and what we can, how we can get there. Um, I don't think that we are going to win that battle unless we st- uh, we 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 expand the, the the realm of 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 knowledge that we have. And I see through this um, through this medium here that you have been pushing the envelope, trying to um, trying to do that. Um, and 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 to keep your your independence from being subordinated to people who might not want you to educate your people, and I congratulate that, and I respect that. I wish that um, that we could um, have more discussions on on topics like these because it's very important that that we educate our people, our young, our people. Um, most of the, most of the problems that we have of of um, in Cayman today. Where we say that um, that that we have all these problems with immigration, we have the problems with 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 the fire service, and we have our problems with this. And when you look at every place that we have problems, nearly every place we see that is because we do not control our own destiny, we do not control our own affairs, how it works. We have to we have to wait for somebody else to tell us what to do, and then we have to go out and pay somebody else to tell us how to do it. <laughs> and so that is the problem that we have, and I hope that, that you will be able to continue the program like this um, in the future, and, um, and it will not be just snuffed out. Okay, thank you very much for that. I want to read some comments that we received from um, uh, our listening audience as well. It's talking about the passing of uh, Ms. Uh, Julian Banks, and it says she's fought a uh, brave fight. Uh, it behooves us all to note the number of sons and daughters of the soil who are passing on. Personally, I believe the amount of stress caused by changes to our lifestyle and the growing unease with mounting uh, uh, mounting overpopulation in our island and traffic increases must now be examined. Who are we developing for, as Mr. Gilbert said? It is high time that our legislators look at protecting the people and children of these islands. Uh, another uh, listener says, uh, good morning, gents. It's one of the saddest days of my life after the passing of my friend, Ms. Julian Banks. And I'm too emotional uh, emotionally distraught to call in about the about topic. However, I want to emphatically state that our leaders must improve in their courage to dare to change the norm as to educate themselves and the youth of today. Change is inevitable. The curriculum must change in our schools to include the history of the Cayman Islands. All age groups from early childhood to tertiary education, we need to move out of the mediocrity of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Uh, Much more can be shared uh, at another time. And another caller uh, uh, from talking about decolonization says, uh, discrimination is the problem in Cayman. The UK's occupation of Cayman is illegal and stands in the way of political and economic freedom. My question, what would happen to Cayman's currency exchange rate if independence was achieved? Uh, The following is an excerpt from an actual UN resolution. And then we had a question in relation to the membership of the decolonization committee, the committee of 24, and as of March of 2014, the members were as follows, Antigua and Barbuda, Bolivia, Chile, China, Congo, um, Ivory Coast, Cuba, Dominica, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Fiji, Grenada, India, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Mali, Nicaragua, Papua New Guinea, Russian Federation, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Sierra Leone, Syria, East Timor, Tunisia, Tanzania, and Venezuela. And when you look at the list of those states, you then wonder why the UK is takes the position uh, that it takes. None of the, the colonizers are there. Right, none mm-hmm. of the colonizers are there, and a lot of these countries themselves had to struggle to in uh, to achieve independence and to get rid of that sovereignty 
uh, that colonial sovereignty Certainly. that was hanging over their heads. Folks, I want to thank you for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy and wet roads of the Cayman Islands into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. I also want to remind you that we are our brothers and our sisters keepers. There is always someone out there who is less fortunate than we are and I ask you to extend a helping hand to them. If you can't do that, then I suggest you donate to Worthy Charity because we always want to consider those who need not necessarily those who want say to you have a great day continue to support your radio station Radio Cayman join Sterling Dwayne e. Banks at 12 noon for a talk today have a great great week and as usual we ask the good Lord to bless these three wonderful beautiful Cayman Islands and bless all of those families that are grieving because of the loss of of loved ones and in particular uh, we ask you to bless and to place your healing hands on the family of Miss Julene Banks. Thank you again. Have a great day.